paneling. I'm pretty. Oh, okay. Um, now we're recorded. Um, thanks, everybody. I'm excited to be able to uh, show some of my work, um, in particular my PhD work in sea level modeling. And I was putting together these slides, and I realized there was two case studies that I I never really got a chance to present outside of my um, PhD defense and and in a more informal setting, uh, partially for COVID and partially for life. Um, so I'm excited to be able to, to present it finally. Um, my name is Evelyn Powell and uh, let's get into it. Okay, so the picture on the left, let me just adjust my screen here. Okay, um, is my favorite example of a sea level marker. It's called Celsius Rock, um, named after the Swedish scientist Anders Celsius, who is better known for the associated temperature scale. Um, and on an island in Finland, no, Sweden, uh, Celsius, he made one of the earliest measurements of sea level fall while observing seals that were perched on rocks. And these seals preferred rocks within a certain distance of the ocean. Um, because you know they could reach the top. And over time, the seals abandoned certain rocks uh, because the rocks were then too far from the ocean such that the seals couldn't get up to the top and they were no longer desirable for perching. And he realized uh, that this meant that sea level was falling. Um, and so for future scientists, he cut a line um, in this rock can you see my cursor? Yeah. Um, in 1731, and through the years, additional scientists have added lines at 100 year increments. Um, and this sea level fall over these uh, 100 years, 200 years, is, is significant. Um, the distance between 1731 and 1831 is 78 centimeters. Uh, for scale, I'll add a person of height five foot two, um, which is how tall I am. So, so we're talking about quite a substantial amount of sea level fall that's associated with the land's emergence from the sea. And that's gonna be a theme we're gonna come back to in a bit. Okay, so I like to start with some, some very big picture um, just to get us all oriented. Um, so the figure at left shows the pattern of modern ice mass change in Antarctica. And we know from geodetic measurements, such as those made by the Grace Satellite Gravity Mission, that the West Antarctic ice sheet, so here's the West Antarctic, here's the East Antarctic. The West Antarctic ice sheet is losing mass and this mass loss is accelerating. And waste alone is thought to contribute three to four meters of potential sea level rise, um, which is equivalent to about the height of a one-story building. Um, the figure right here shows the region of Louisiana's coastline that would be flooded in the event of such a sea level rise. So, so today I'm gonna be talking about sea level changes that are arising due to our, our dynamic cryosphere, as opposed to, for example, like ocean dynamics. We're, we're talking about cryosphere-driven sea level changes. Okay, so for a quick outline of my presentation, um, I'm gonna talk about sea level modeling in general, some of the science, some science behind it, and then move on to two to three case studies um, in two different regions, in Canada and in Antarctica. Um, in fleshing out this presentation, I realized I may have too much content, so I'm gonna focus, since this is a sea level seminar, on the sea level modeling results. And if we have time, get into the geodetic viscosity inferences, but if not, I'm happy to talk with you about it at a later point. Um, and then I'll touch briefly on the future and current work that I've been up to as a postdoc here at Lamont. Okay, so let's start with some background on sea level modeling. And, and if anyone has any questions or, or points of clarification, please feel free to, to ask as we go along. Okay, so when Modeling sea level changes, um, there are three key players. These are the oceans, the 
the ice sheets and the solid earth upon which <laughs> these two masses rest. So let's go through these in turn and start with the oceans. So water is a liquid. This is a bit basic, but, but water is a liquid. And a liquid takes the shape of a container and maintains almost fixed volume. Uh, my favorite demonstration of these liquid properties are from the Ig Nobel Prize a few years ago, uh, which demonstrated that cats are liquids. OK, so oceans <laughs> will take the shape of their container. Um, in this case, uh, we think about the container set by the ocean basins um, and the gravitational equipotential surface that corresponds to mean sea surface height. So with that framework, we can define a global sea level field, which is the height of this gravitational equipotential surface minus the solid Earth surface. So ocean, the ocean will fill its container, which exists anywhere the Earth's surface is below this gravitational equipotential surface, and there isn't an ice sheet in the way. Okay. So next, let's turn to the ice sheets. We know from proxies for ice volume, uh, such as what's being shown in the plot here, um, I'm showing delta O18 from benthic foraminifera on the y-axis, uh, which is a proxy for ice volume with ice volume increasing downwards, um, and then time and millions of year before present uh, with time increasing to the um, display, what is that, to the right, to the right. Um, so, so we know from these sorts of proxies that the global ice volume has not been constant through time. And you can see this cyclic pattern of global ice volume change. Um, and this reflects that ice sheets, these large scale um, features have waxed and waned uh, through what are called the late Pleistocene glacial cycles. So about 21,000 years ago, uh, global ice volumes uh, were much greater than they are today, and ice covered much of the northern hemisphere, for example. Okay, so finally, let's turn to the solid Earth. So the manner in which the solid Earth responds to forcings depends upon the time scale of that forcing. I'll, I'll give some examples um, relative to this schematic timescale axis. So on shorter timescales, um, forcings that act on these short timescales, for example, tides, uh, and I'll do a quick animation. Okay, uh, the Earth's response is considered elastic, in which case all of the strain that occurs due to this forcing is recoverable. For forcings that act on much longer million of year timescales, um, such as thermally driven mantle convection, the solid earth uh, instead behaves more like a viscous fluid. Now it turns out that the isostatic adjustment to ocean and ice loads uh, occurs on intermediate timescales. Let's just move this to the side. Um, and the earth responds to this surface loading uh, forcing in a manner that is viscoelastic. So there's both a uh, time variable viscous component as well as an instantaneous elastic response. Now, our ability to understand past sea level changes as well as predict polar ice sheet contributions to future sea level rise, um, it, it depends on our ability to accurately model the Earth's response to surface mass loading. Um, and this deformational, gravitational, and rotational response to uh, I call H2O mass exchanges between ice sheets and the oceans uh, is termed glacial isostatic adjustment, so GIA. All right, so again, about 21,000 years ago, uh, there was a heavy ice sheet that covered Canada or Scandinavia, and this acted as a load on the solid surface, and then the loaded crust would sink. And the deformation of the solid earth that's involved in the sinking um, includes both the elastic 
contraction of the crystalline mantle material, as well as the time delayed viscous creep of the mantle, um, which involves the movement of disquelations and, and diffusion of vacancies through the crystal lattice. So, so the mantle flows outward um, to the periphery of the ice sheet where the surface isn't being loaded and forms what are called peripheral bulges. Okay. But then as the climate changes and the ice sheet melts away, global sea levels rise because there's more water volume to be accommodated, but also because the perturbed crust rebounds as the mantle flows back from the collapsing peripheral floor bulges. Um, and this process of the solid earth returning to its equilibrium condition, it continues long after the ice sheet has completely melted. All right, so, so why does GIA matter? I don't know that I actually have to convince everyone of this because we're in a sea level seminar, but just in case, um, I've already told you one reason, which is that studies of past, present, and future sea level must count for contributions from GIA, um, but also because of the insight that GIA can provide on the Earth's interior. But let's, let's take a quick look. Um, at that case study motivated by our uh, a picture at the beginning. So we're gonna look at that example of GIA in the Baltic Sea and in Scandinavia. So some of the earliest um, examples of GIA uh, and observations therein are in the Scandinavian area. So shown here on the plot here are um, the red triangles correspond to GPS receivers from the Bif Bifrost GPS network. Um, and in the 1990s and early 2000s, what we observed is a uplift rate corresponding to um, this long-term response to this previously present ice sheet. So the, the ice loading caused crustal deformation, um, which still occurs today and leads to an uplift rate in excess of 10 millimeters per year. And that rock that I talked about earlier, um, Celsius rock is found in this region in Sweden, this island here. Um, and so sea level fall was a regionally observable phenomenon, um, even prior to 1888, when this connection between ice sheets and sea level uh, was, was understood. Okay, so uh, GIA is also important because it provides constraints on the viscosity of the Earth's mantle, um, which plays a pretty fundamental role in the long-term evolution of the Earth's system. Um, so over time scales associated with mantle convection, the 3D viscosity field is going to control the planet's uh, long-term thermal history, plant form of convective flow, the stability of the rotation axis, um, among other things. But the issue is that this viscosity field is, let's say, difficult to constrain in the lab. So I'm gonna, context on this, I'm gonna pull from another Ig Nobel Prize winner, um, which is the pitch drop experiment, um, which is the longest running laboratory experiment uh, conducted by humans. So the pitch, this otherwise solid material, um, forms a droplet approximately every decade. And scientists were able to use the timing of this droplet formation to constrain the pitch to approximately 10 to seven Pascal seconds. Now, in contrast, the viscosity of the mantle is thought to be in excess of 10 to the 20 Pascal seconds. And so humans are, are simply not long lived enough to make such observations of olivines or, or other mantle materials, fluid like behavior in the lab. Um, my office mate, Hatsuki Yamauchi, uses um, analog materials, and, and I am inspired by her work. Um, so, so there are workarounds and able to get laboratory estimates, but um, we can also use the earth as a kind of natural laboratory and use observations of the GIA process to constrain the mantle's viscosity. Okay, <laughs> so how do we, or how do sea level modelers um, go about um, numerically calculating the GIA process? All right, so we start with the sea level equation, in which case, um, the 
gravitational self-attraction and loading effects that are associated with this redistribution of glacial meltwater. Um, they're accounted for by, by solving the sea level equation that was first put forward by Farrell and Clark in 1976. Um, I'm going to keep my discussion somewhat schematic. So the globally defined sea level at any given point on the Earth's surface is a function of changes to the total surface loading. That is both the ice load and the ocean load. Okay, and here we run into our first issue, which is that the ocean load is just the global sea level within the area of the ocean basins. Um, so now we have sea level on both the left-hand side and the right-hand side of the equation, or you can think about it that what we're solving for is a function of itself. Okay, so there are procedures that are have been developed that allow us to solve this equation. Um, the standard method uh, outlined here in this 1991 paper um, involves a numerical scheme with, with iteration. Okay, so that's handled. So our second issue is defining what exactly this function is. I'll outline it in green. Okay, so in principle, what we need to know is how the solid Earth's surface and gravitational field respond to applied surface stresses. In which case, what we need to know, um, we need to know the viscous and elastic properties of the entirety of the solid Earth. And uh, typically, GIA calculations assume a linear Maxwell rheology, um, which is the simplest combination of this viscous and elastic, elastic element, um, but more complex models do exist. So until recently, uh, most GIA predictions were based on what are called 1D Earth models, um, which assume that Earth's viscoelastic structure, uh, it varies only with depth. So you can think of like an onion skin view of the work the world. Now, um, the benefit to this uh, assumption is that in this case, the response to changes in surface loading uh, can be calculated semi-analytically by Green's functions, um, which is why I colored the function green. That's my mathematical pun of the talk. Okay, so issue number three is that the area of the ocean basins, it varies through time, and it's a function of both the ice load and the sea level. Um, so we therefore include a check for the presence or absence of ice sheets that are marine based or grounded below sea level, um, as in this top panel here. One notable example of a marine based ice sheet is the West Antarctic ice sheet, um, which will be important later. Okay, um, we also have to take into account the migration of shorelines. So here in this cartoon at right, we have a shoreline that's far away from our ice sheet, um, which is melting. And after the ice melt, the shoreline it migrates to a new position because the volume of water in the ocean basin increased and because the additional loading, um, it's ocean loading, led to subsidence of the solid earth. So the, the total change in sea level from this scenario is given by the darker blue region. All right. Issue number four, <laughs> the mass redistribution um, is going to actually change Earth's moment of inertia. Um, you can imagine or I imagine uh, the loads acting as a lever that torque the Earth um, and lead to a new rotation axis. Um, and this perturbation to the rotation axis also leads to a sea level signal that you have to account for. Finally, <laughs> issue number five, um, I'll talk about the most today um, is that Earth's viscoelastic parameters vary more than just with depth. They they also vary laterally. So seismic tomographic inferences, um, such as made from the global S4 BRTS model, um, shown here from its mid all 2011, they show significant lateral variations in seismic wave velocities. And if we assume a thermal origin of these anomalies, they imply lateral variations in mantle viscosity of three to four orders of magnitude. Uh, you can see um, sort of colder, uh, more, uh, more viscous downwelling slabs here, as well as the presence of, of hotter, um, less viscous material in this cross section. All right, so over the last two decades, um, GIA modelers have uh, started incorporating 
more realistic or, or spherically asymmetric, so 3D Earth models um, in their analyses of, of sea level change, um, in which case we can contrast these with the 1D viscoelastic model has mantle viscosity varying only with depth, and we can calculate changes therein quite quickly. Whereas if we want to consider um, variations in both the sphere thickness or the mantle viscosity field, um, a 3D viscoelastic model, um, turns out that's quite computationally expensive. Um, but a lot of my work has really focused on uh, regions in the world where I would say you, you do need to think about this in a 3D manner. Okay, so with all that, um, let's get into our first case study. I'm looking at Akimiski Island, uh, Canada. So the map of Canada at left shows the rough range for tribal lands at the time of European contact. Um, and you can see the Cree here in blue um, near Hudson Bay uh, and James Bay, the smaller light to Canada. Okay, so this case study focuses on Akamiski Island, Canada. It's the largest island in James Bay. Uh, <laughs> I'm Texan, it's delightfully taco shaped. Um, and it has a boreal forest setting that you can see from the satellite photo. Um, and it is the ancestral land of the James Bay Cree. All right, so now I am showing a present day political map of Canada. Um, and I wanna be quite explicit and say that present day Canada was created through land acquisitions. And Akamiski Island, again boxed here, was incorporated by the Canadian government into the Inuit territory, uh, Nunavut, in 1999, so quite, quite recently. However, the James Bay Cree maintain that they have never relinquished their claim to Akamiski Island through treaty or, or any other means. So herein lies the problem. Two Canadian indigenous groups uh, lay claim to Akamiski Island, the Inuit through the Nunavut Act of 1993 and the Western James Bay Cree through Aboriginal title, um, the collective right to the use of and jurisdiction over um, a group's ancestral territories. Um, the signing of the Nunavut Act by Brian Mulroney, uh, the Canadian prime minister and Paul Kassa the Inuit elder and head of Nunavut at the time is shown in the picture. Now, this dispute can be settled um, because a common law test of Aboriginal title, this, this, this right to a, a group's ancestral territories, um, a test exists in Canada. However, through its inaction, um, the Canadian government has switched the burden of proof from the Inuit to the Cree. So it- uh, Evelyn, the... uh, Yes. Sorry. There's a question in, in the chat from Vivian. Um, Absolutely. She says, uh, geographically, why is the island part of Ontario? So why, it, why um, isn't it part of Ontario? So it's included. So I don't know if you can tell, it, it's, it's this lighter blue. You, you'd think it would be included in Ontario. Um, oh, she says, what? why not? <laughs> yeah, why? so exactly. Um, there are different answers I could give to that. I mean, one of the intentions, the, the intention of the Nunavut Act was, was quite good. Um, and the idea was to include this land, which, which is um, the, the traditional, traditionally occupied by First Nations group. Um, into this territory that is more dedicated to, to these First Nation groups. Um, the issue is that they incorporated it into the Inuit territory as opposed to um, a Cree equivalent. Um, but including it in Ontario is, is one possible solution. Okay, hopefully that answered the question. Um, right. Okay, so um, for the Cree then, um, they need to prove 
uh, accordance with uh, the six criterion for the common law test for proof of Aboriginal title. Um, and quite a bit of work has gone into this uh, since 1999 um, when this issue uh, arose. But one thing that remains to be proven is accordance with criterion two. Um, so that is that the, the organized society has occupied the specific territory over which it asserts, um, let me read it, over which it asserts Aboriginal title since time immemorial. Um, so that is that the traditional use and occupancy of the territory um, must have been sufficient to be an established fact at the time of assertion of sovereignty by European nations. So um, for this common law test, then uh, the Cree must prove use and occupancy uh, pre-European contact, so about 400 years ago. All right, this is fascinating, but why, why are sea level modelers involved? Why was I involved at all? Um, it turns out that one prevalent story in the pre-oral history um, is one of Akamiski Island's emergence from the sea. So according to pre-oral history, the, the Inuit first used Akamiski Island to, to hunt seals when, when the island was first emerging and it was more of a sandbar. However, the Inuit later abandoned it because the number of seals decreased due to the evolution of the island habitat and or the Cree forced them off. Um, but what's unknown is the timing of these events. So that is, um, when did this island emergence occur? And, and more to the point, was it pre-European contact around 400 years ago? So to answer this question, to, to timestamp this pre-oral history, um, we modeled sea level changes in James Bay uh, associated with the last deglaciation. And for our modeling, we require two inputs, a spatiotemporal history of ice cover and a, um, uh, the plot here shows um, estimates of the aerial extent of the uh, Laurentide ice sheet that covered Canada at different time slices. Um, and then we also require a model of, in this case, Earth's 3D viscoelastic structure. So um, we perform 10 simulations um, using published ice history models, um, as well as Earth models, which were generated from seismic tomography models. Um, and the plot at right here shows mantle viscosity variations um, in log 10 pascal seconds uh, at a depth slice of 400 kilometers from one of these Earth models. And so uh, for the simulation I'm gonna show results for, um, the, we use the ice history model I6G and um, inferences of mantle viscosity from the seismic tomography model S4ERTS. But we, we also ran nine additional simulations um, based on different 3D viscoelastic growth models and, and ice histories. All right, so our um, modeled sea level is constrained by present day observations. Um, that is the 10 simulations must match present day shorelines and they must fit the observed coastal uplift rate at the Musini site. So we have one observation, one geodetic observation of GPS uplift rate. Uh, uh, 9.3 plus or minus about 0 0.3 millimeters per year. So, so it is uplifting quite rapidly. All right, and we also must validate our models against available data. So this, in this case, I'm showing um, sea level rel relative to present um, in meters on the y-axis, and then time in thousands of years before present on the x-axis with time going towards present to the right. Um, and the local sea level data in the James Bay region um, these include sea level index points, as well as terrestrial eliminating and marine limiting data. And they show a, a broad pattern of fall over the past 8,000 years. And the colored lines here um, each represent one simulation of an ice and earth model pair. And happily, um, these simulations do fit uh, the available data. Okay, so with that, uh, we can turn to answering our original question, uh, which is, when did Akamiski Island emerge from the sea? So I'm going to show um, paleotopography predictions um, for, for that one simulation here. And the dotted black line um, is the present day shoreline of James Bay, Canada. And in this first panel, you can see that 
two and a half thousand years ago, Akamiski Island, it did not exist. We have all blues here. All right, we step forward 500 years, um, and if you squint, you can see the first sliver of green. So at this time, Akamiski would have been a sandbar, um, as we heard in the oral history, uh, favorable to seals. Then if we step forward another 500 years, um, the aerial extent has increased. And also at this time, the ecology would have been transitioning to a more woodland setting, so 500 years, so 2,000 um, to one and a half thousand years ago, that would have been sufficient time for an emergent sandbar to evolve into a boreal forest. Then Akamiski reached about 50% of its current aerial extent a thousand years ago. Uh, it continued to emerge to its present day shoreline. So we estimate on the basis of this first simulation that Akamiski Island um, emerged from James Bay at uh, 2030 years ago, which is certainly pre-European contact. So that's great. But what about the other nine simulations? Um, so I'm showing here on this plot the predicted emergence date um, on the y-axis in years before present, um, as well as the simulation number on the x-axis. And there is some spread. Um, you can see that, that all simulations predict island emergence at around 2,000 years ago. OK, so some takeaways from this first case study. Um, the Cree oral history, it, it describes um, the emergence of Akamiski Island from the sea and our sea level modeling of this event, it, it quantitatively supports their claim. So we're able to timestamp emergence of the island to about 2000 plus or minus 100 years ago. Um, and the work which is undertaken here um, demonstrates that the Cree traditional use and occupancy was sufficient to be established at the time of assertion of European nations, a uh, sovereignty of European nations, which uh, addresses criterion two of Aboriginal title. So now the Cree have sufficient basis um, to enter into the recognition and implementation of indigenous rights process um, for Akamiski Island. I have a quote here. Um, so as noted by Senator Lorna Milne of the Government of Canada, um, many of the complaints, the boundary and Aboriginal title issues related to Akamiski Island were originally with the Nunavut Act itself. That is when they should have properly been addressed. Unfortunately, they were not addressed at that time. Um, the First Nation representatives are quite right. The Canadian government did not do its job. Um, from the Parliament of Canada in 1999. Okay, so if you're interested in learning more, um, feel free to talk to me after this, but you can also um, read the paper just published in Arctic. Uh, and so I, I only detailed my efforts and the sea level modeling side of this, this story, but there's quite a bit more work um, that was conducted by my, my excellent co-authors. So Lionel Suji, Stephen Suji, First Nations representative, Zachariah General, um, as well as a, a whole team of translators and community members um, that, that work included actually conducting the interviews with the Cree elders in the culturally appropriate um, semi-directed interview format, um, as well as a really deep dive and detailed analysis of, of the how the oral history converges with the written record. All right, and I'll, I'll just close this case study with, with a bit of color, which is that uh, the word Akamiski is derived from Cree words, and those are Aka for across and Aski for land, that is saying that there is a land across here. Okay. Um, uh, we have uh, a couple more questions. Um, I thought so, <laughs> yep. Uh, Vivian asks, can you also corroborate timing of emergence by analysis of paleo sea level proxies in beach, offshore, or marsh sediment cores? And Gavin added, or tree rings. Absolutely. <laughs> oh, tree rings. Um, so one application of tree rings might be um, how old any tree rings are, right? So like if you have a tree that is 6,000 years old, then, then that would imply that the island was there 6,000 years ago. Um, but for the, um, the sea level marker oh, side, oh dear, I've lost my presentation. Okay. Okay. Um, let's see. Yes, 
we absolutely do. And so, and so that's part of what we're doing here is, is corroborating with the, the sea level data that um, it does exist in James Bay, but it doesn't exist on the island. So in that sense, yes, but we're, we're able to, to fill in the gap, as it were, to, to get the estimate like at the location of the island. Gavin okay. said he was thinking uh, maybe fossil tree stumps or logs. Could mm -hmm. um, yes, I, I don't know of any studies that do that, but I could certainly see it. Yeah. Okay. Yes. All right. Um, all right. <laughs> I am going to be out of time. Let's move on to our second case study. Um, looking at Antarctica now, let's switch hemispheres, um, and looking at sea level predictions there. And maybe viscosity inferences if we have time, but I don't think we will. All right. So for Antarctica, um, regional seismic tomographic models, they're, they're providing unprecedented images of upper mantle structure. Um, and this plot here on the left uh, is taken from Andrew Lloyd, um, his recent adjoint-based work uh, showing variations in seismic wave speed at uh, 125 kilometers depth. Yeah, 125. And you can see this dichotomy between east and west Antarctica. It's quite abundantly, it's quite abundantly clear here. Um, the cratonic east Antarctic is characterized by faster wave speeds, um, whereas in the west, this failed rift system um, is evidenced by a thinned lithosphere, which is underlain by an inferred thermal upwelling. I'm not going to get into the debate whether or not it's a hotspot or sort of um, relict signature, but, but there is an inferred thermal upwelling. There is hotter, less viscous material underlying the West Antarctic ice sheet. OK, so this 3D structure um, has been shown to affect ice sheet evolution. So the, um, the rebound affecting how um, a retreating ice sheet might um, be stabilized by this rebound effect. It also affects the GIA corrections that are used in the interpretation of brace gravity measurements of present day mass changes, um, as well as predictions of sea level changes uh, in the event of significant mass loss. And so that's what I'm going to focus in on next. So Antarctica's mantle structure is highly complex. And there is this um, region in West Antarctica where you have this inferred thermal upwelling. And, and I call this in my ever so uh, colloquial way, the, the mantle is hot and squishy underneath West Antarctica. So how would this affect um, predictions of global mean sea level in the event of West Antarctic ice sheet collapse? And how effective are 1D viscosity models in capturing interglacial sea level signals that are recorded in, for example, corals um, in the far field? All right, let's get into it. So one signal that's associated with the waste collapse, because it is a marine-based ice sheet, because it's grounded below sea level, is that when you remove the West Antarctic ice sheet, you're going to get a signal associated with water expulsion. Right, so you're going to have viscoelastic uplift um, of the solid surface, which is going to push water out into the open ocean further afield. Now, because of the very low viscosity beneath the West Antarctic, um, this estimate of water expulsion is going to be incompletely captured. And um, my friend and colleague, Linda Pan, demonstrated this. Um, we, we showed um, with this scheme. So um, we created some earth models, so a traditional 1D viscoelastic model, as well as a model that incorporates 3D viscoelastic structure and this low viscosity and thin lithosphere beneath, beneath waste. And we apply a forcing, in this case, waste collapse. So we just remove all of the Western Earth day sheet um, or all of the marine base sectors and generate for each model uh, sea level predictions and global mean sea level predictions. And uh, to do this, we adopt 
and we earlier did as well, but I forgot to mention it. Um, we adopt the finite volume software, um, which is described in Latichev et al. 2005. And what's shown here um, is a figure of the high resolution grid refinement within the Antarctic subdomain, um, which is indicated by the green line. Okay, so there we go. Okay, so let's take a look at some results. Um, after a complete collapse of marine based sectors of the West Antarctic ice sheet, so outlined in black here on the left, um, we see viscoelastic uplift and therefore increased water expulsion. So we take all of the ice off um, first time step and allow the system to evolve over 4,000 years. And you can see um, this is showing sea level changes. So the negative here is showing that topography is increasing by um, almost a kilometer in the center. The result of this um, deformational effect is that um, global mean sea level, uh, it, it's quite a bit higher than previously thought. So I'm showing here um, a plot of total global mean sea level predicted um, in meters on the y-axis and time and thousands of years with time increasing towards the right. Um, so 10,000 years after the simulation, it's pretty much um, uh, reached its asymptote. Um, and our black line here is the global mean sea level we get with our 3D sea level model. Um, and it's about a meter higher than what you would get without this, this revised um, outflux signal. And then the, the shaded gray region is um, predicted contribution from um, a more um, standard 1D model. So essentially we're, we're getting, instead of three quarters of a one-story building, uh, we're getting the whole one-story building of flooding. So, so quite a big uh, rev revision here. All right, so back to our questions then. So does it affect GMSL? Yes, quite a bit. Um, but then also we think about sea level, not just in this instantaneous collapse, right? We just essentially got a, a speed limit or, or a total contribution that the West Antarctic could give. Um, but we don't necessarily think during prior interglacials or in, or in the next interglacial that this ice sheet change is going to happen instantaneously. Um, and the sea level changes are recorded um, by, for example, um, different proxies in the far field, so, so coral records especially. Um, and we want to think about how effective our 1D modeling is in, in capturing these interglacial sea level signals that are recorded in the far field. Um, and really, I was thinking about how this far field signal um, is affected by different waste collapse scenarios and duration. So, so instead of having a single time step, remove the ice, have a, have a more protracted collapse. So in this case, um, the West Antarctic does not have complete collapse, but it does have significant reduction in ice cover over 6,000 years. Um, and this plot on the right shows the global mean sea level prediction from this um, scenario, where after about 6,000 years, just about three meters of sea level rise um, has occurred. Okay, um, but also how is it affected by our assumptions regarding Earth's structure? So, so we considered here um, three different Earth models. I'll show results for three different Earth models. We consider the others. Um, uh, two 3D models and then one 1D model, which is the, the background radial structure. So M3DA, um, the big uh, difference is you can see the viscosity is the variations are more muted, um, whereas M3DB, the viscosity variations are about twice as large um, in a log 10 sense. So orders of magnitude we're considering here. All right. So what I'm showing here now are the resulting sea level predictions in a global sense um, for these two Earth models after we've applied our sea level change and predicted what sea level will do um, with saturation so that you can see the signal in the far field. And the triangles here are different sites um, where we're going to look at the time history uh, going forward. OK, so you can see actually pretty similar signal um, between the two models, at least at first glance. You can see this 
fun uh, quadrantial signature is associated with, with rotation, um, which I talked about earlier. Okay, but then if we look at the residual of the 3D model minus our 1D, so onion skin view of the world, um, we can see that the 1D model, it doesn't always capture the, the realities of the sea level signature. Um, and this is especially true for the case of the viscosity model with, with higher variations in, sea, in, in viscosity, which um, that, that tracks with our understanding of how this will work. Um, but then if we look at those specific sites, um, and so what I really want you to draw your attention to are the solid lines here. Um, so in blue, we're showing the residual of the 3D model and 3D A, so that muted viscosity variation model and our 1D model. And then in red, we have the variations from the, the higher viscosity model change um, minus again our 1D model. And we get, we get kind of different results here. Um, some sites perform quite well, regardless. Um, the 1D model, it, it captures the, the signature that, that we predict with the 3D um, calculation. So in the Seychelles or in the Bahamas, we, we actually get a pretty good result. Um, in the middle here showing two sites where the um, 1D model does a good job um, in the case of the um, sort of M3DA, whereas a worse performance in the case of the M3DB. And then in the um, left, leftmost, rightmost panel here, um, two cases where uh, both uh, are, both 3D models are not really captured by, by the 1D modeling. And there are a number of re reasons for this. So, so there are different sources of variability in um, the observed sea level signal. So these are gonna be both in the near field and in the far field. So we could think about um, continental levering. It's gonna be an example of, of an effect right nearby to the, to the sea level site. Um, but also um, a big signal is gonna be associated with the peripheral bulge and the peripheral bulge of the West Antarctic ice sheet. So at top here are showing the sea level prediction um, after 6,000 years of the 3 dA model and the 3 dB model. And you can see that the model with the lower viscosity underneath West Antarctic, which extended um, into the, the Pacific Ocean here, it has a much broader um, peripheral bulge collapse. And the 1D models um, do different levels of, of success at capturing that um, that signal. Okay, so just to conclude this second case study, um, we investigate the effects of Antarctica's 3D mantle structure on sea level predictions of waste collapse, and we see that the waste contribution to global mean sea level was previously underestimated by about one meter, and this is due to the the water expulsion mechanism, but in particular due to the low viscosity beneath West Antarctica. Um, and analyses of past or future interglacial sea level, they're, they're going to require one more accurate 3D mental viscosity modeling inputs, um, but also I think a more nuanced understanding of the spatial temporal history of waste ice cover. Because um, you can imagine this, this water expulsion mechanism is only going to occur um, if you remove the ice sheet. If you end up with an ice sheet that's just very thin but still grounded, you're not going to experience that same um, kind of, of water expulsion. Okay, so if you're interested in learning more, um, here are those two studies, um, or feel free to ask me more. Um, I am running out of time. So hopefully I convinced you that this 3D structure um, affects our sea level predictions. And I'll just touch on, on some, some of my, my former and, and current work, um, which is motivated by the fact that this conversion um, to mantle viscosity structure is, is highly uncertain. So the viscosity that you infer from a seismic tomography model, um, it's going to depend upon the rock microphysics that you consider um, and the parameters in that conversion, they're, they're highly uncertain. Um, uh, not least because, as I mentioned, it's difficult for laboratory experiments um, to be performed under mantle-like conditions um, and over appropriately long time scales. 
Um, but additionally, so many relevant parameters, so like um, uh, mental material grain size, uh, water content, they're, they're simply unknown um, at this time. So the viscosity from the same tomography model inferred from the same input can vary by orders of magnitude, which is concerning if we're wanting to model these sea level changes. Um, so we do have an additional, and I would argue um, underutilized resource at our disposal uh, to improve our constraints on mental viscosity, um, in which the observations of GIA-induced deformation by surveying using the global positioning system, it can be leveraged uh, to constrain mental properties. Um, so and these include sites, this is my favorite picture uh, of a GPS and there's a little penguin. Um, sites such as this one and Antarctica um, shown by the circles in the plot. And you can see there's significant coverage um, across the Antarctic Peninsula, uh, the Transantarctic Mountain Range and, and along the coast. And for the interest of time, I'm going to skip the rest of this case study. Um, so please talk to me afterwards if you'd like to hear more. Um, but I'll just I'll just jump to the takeaways, um, which is that if we want to be able to use the GPS data to um, infer viscoelastic structure, we find that the sort of traditional 1D modeling approach um, it doesn't work as well as we might hope. Um, we saw that we poorly capture the average renal viscosity and, and we missed the, the peak to peak variability in mental viscosity structure. Um, okay, so jumping forward then, um, so some of my future and current work here at Lamont, we are uh, returning to, to Scandinavia, uh, to those geodetic data sets that I talked about in the very beginning of this talk. Um, and really what we're looking at is, is what, we, what can we learn from the available geodetic data, especially now that these um, observations are, are so long lived. And so the error, the uncertainty in these observations, um, it decreases as you increase your observation time length. So um, how are our inferences of mental viscosity affected and how are our sea level predictions affected by, um, for example, modern ice mass loss, um, the Earth's 3D viscoelastic structure, um, inclusion of tide gauge observations, and more. And then also um, another geodetic data set we're looking at using um, is uh, gray satellite gravity observations. So we infer modern ice mass changes from, from satellite gravity measurements. Um, but one issue is that due to the realities of having an atmosphere, uh, these satellites have to be, be quite far from, from the surface of the Earth. And so um, that leads to a pretty, pretty low resolution in terms of spatial scale. So around 350 kilometers um, spatial resolution. And so what we're looking at now is, can we use the sea level equation um, to increase this resolution? So, so bump up that spatial scale. All right, um, so to conclude, um, Say with, with accurate 3D GI modeling, um, we can tackle big picture questions um, for the scientific community and for society at large. Um, it's one of, the, one of my favorite parts of sea level modeling is it really is human focused. Um, so this includes both modeling the sea level response to past, present and future changes to our cryosphere. Um, and again, I didn't touch on this uh, really this time around, but, but also using geodetic data to improve our understanding of the mantle. Okay, and just, here's my email and just say thank you so much. And I'm very happy to take any questions. Hopefully I'm not over Thanks. time. It's okay. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Evelyn. Um, mm. It was very fascinating. <laughs> um, do we have any more questions? Yes, Gavin, Gavin. 
Hi, uh, that was uh, that was that was very interesting. Uh, this, yeah. So, um, I a couple of couple of questions. I mean, so using the three D viscosity obviously does change things, um, and you know, once we're trying to model, you know, the retreat of the big glaciers, uh, it might, you know, make an make make a, a material difference to how fast these things go. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so obviously that's something that we need to be uh, incorporating. Now, um, when we've uh, when we've talked to uh, to Jackie and other folks, uh, and uh, you know, and they said, okay, well, you know, if you've got a change of mass in the system, then you can calculate the change in the um, uh, you know the gravitational, rotational, and deformational uh, parts using this kind of pretty straightforward uh, mechanism. Uh, do, does that modeling rely on a constant viscosity profile, or or would you need to, um, or, or 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 is that kind of uh, that doesn't work if you have three D GIS? So uh, that's a good question. Okay, let me let me pull up a different um, slide. So I think one way to think about it is that the um, the sea level equation, when we saw this, let's go back to this one. Um, we need to, we have as input um, two, two things, especially we have the spatial temporal history of ice cover. So our, our load source, um, but then also um, how the solid earth and how the gravitational field uh, will respond to will respond to that loading. Um, and so so that's our second input is is the model of Earth's structure, um, which really is just what is the rheology of, in this case, the mantle and lithosphere. Um, and so the sort of early days of sea level modeling, we assume a, a simple uh, earth structure where viscosity and, and viscoelastic properties, they only vary with depth. Um, you can solve the same sea level equation um, with a different model of Earth structure. It just, you can't use the same simplifying assumptions anymore. Uh, you have to solve it with, with either finite volume or finite element methods. Um, so it, it can become quite computationally expensive, but, but it's the same general idea. You're solving the same equation. It's just the, the means by which you solve the equation changes. Yeah, but there's a difference between, you know, doing something and it's like three lines of MATLAB or doing something and it's like a whole like three dimensional uh, inverse model, blah, blah, blah. You know, I mean, that, that's those are those are very different kinds of tasks. Right. I mean, are, are you are you suggesting that? Uh, that the GRD corrections that one would get using the standard methods that you know the jury and, and, and folks uh, uh, pioneered is that is that not sufficient? Is it first order okay? Second order not? Like what's what what what's what's the uh, what's the cost in assuming that those GRD calculations are valid? So it, it depends on what you're looking at. Um, so well, I mean, we're, we're, we're mostly looking at uh, sea level projections for the next hundred years, right? So, uh, you know, is it an important factor for those or not? That's, that's basically the bottom line. Right. Um, I think yes and no. So it's not going to matter as much for Greenland. Um, Greenland has earth structure that is arguably pretty well captured by, by 1D earth modeling. Um, we, we haven't been able to demonstrate that the sea level signature with the 3D model is significantly better. I think with West Antarctica, however, um, 3D modeling is gonna be pretty important, or, or at least um, it depends on how regional you wanna consider. You can use a 1D model that has very low viscosity in the upper mantle um, to, to get a better prediction, um, but then that gets a better local prediction, but then you you vastly um, don't predict the, the far field signature as well, right? Because the whole earth isn't like 10 to the 18 Pascal seconds in the upper mantle. Like that's that's not um, consistent with with other observations. So so it's kind of a it depends on where you're looking and it depends on which ice sheet you're considering. I mean given given future changes in mass, mm -hmm. 
uh, projected from you know various kinds of models. Uh, what is what is the computational cost in calculating what the GRD contribution would be using a three D approach? I mean that that you have. I mean, like if we gave you a mass field change, could you give us the GRD map? In yes. A, so and so this is where the. <laughs> Yeah, um, so so I can give a hard number. Um, so for one example of um, this is also from Linda Linda Pan Science Advances paper. Um, there was a sea level projection scenario um, that was also considered, and by twenty one hundred, um, uh, you have about a fifteen percent increase um, in what you would predict versus a 3D model or sort of the more business as usual 1D computation. Um, and, and so this is work that's really being looked at right now by Natalia Gomez's group um, and her postdoc, Mary Musefi. Um, so I might shunt responsibility uh, slightly for that question to, to Natalia, but yeah. Right, but in order to do Oh, sorry, your actual question. Like, yeah. How long does it take? Okay, um, so if we're using um, MATLAB and a sort of standard laptop, the 1D case for a, you know, full cycle deglaciation consideration, um, let's go with about an hour. Um, it's <laughs> faster if you use Fortran, but it's about an hour. Um, if you want to consider 3D structure, especially on the sort of um, fine resolution that you would want to in Antarctica um, that you have to go to high performance computing and then it's about say 300 CPUs for about a week. So it is it is significantly different. Okay, but not impossibly so. Okay, thank not you. impossibly so. No, I, I would say it's impossible to do a proper per, a proper parameter sweep. Um, we definitely can't do that, but but we can make these calculations. Yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, Dorothy, a question? Yeah, <clears throat> thanks for your talk. Really interesting. Um, my comment, I guess, is the map you showed of dikes has been in, um, I don't think they were using calibrated dates. Mm -hmm. So you would have to make everything older. Um, oh, right. On a gradational scale. So I wonder if that would significantly affect what you use for your island. No, that that's a great point, and I, I should have I should have made it more clear. That was just a schematic. Um, I just like that image of of yeah. showing the aerial extent. What we actually used was was I six G in in the simulation that I showed. Um, okay, so did they use the calibrated ages? There are also some updates to that. So, for example, the eighteen K is twenty one, and the mm -hmm. um, and the timing for the glacial retreat on the eastern side of the U.S. is is really controversial. Yes. Um, so so yes, it is it is twenty one. Um, but I think so. Some of um, Tamara Pico's work uh, looking at, at lake cores and and um, and different signals uh, revised even there some of the the eastern side of the Laurentide Ice Sheet retreat. So I don't think. In that model, we used one of her revisions, um, but I, I don't okay. think it yeah. would change our, our result significantly. But but yes, it's just something you might look at, yeah, to see if it does. Yeah, yeah. Thanks. Oh, well, thank you. Uh, we had a question from Vivian. Also, uh, Vivian, would you like to? Um, Unmute, or I can ask the question otherwise. Okay. Um, let's see, the question was um, what effects? Oh, she can't unmute. Let's see. Oh. <laughs> I'm going to try to. Okay, I think Vivian's unmuted. 
Uh, but we don't hear anything. Okay, um, I guess I'll ask the question. Um, so uh, what effects does the waste 3D mantle viscosity structure have on future sea level rise on continent or on centennial time scales? Oh, okay. You yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, so maybe, maybe I already answered that, but um, I can repeat it since it's fascinating. So um, you get a difference um, by 2100 um, between your, your 1D prediction and your 3D prediction. Um, by about 15%. So um, you get 15% more um, contribution to, to global mean sea level, um, even on that quite short time scale. Okay, any other questions? Cool. Patrick, I think I think you're muted. Oh, yes, sorry. <laughs> I think we can wrap up then. So thanks again, Avun. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, thanks. Uh, maybe we can talk some more about this, um, uh, you know, since you're so close uh, over the next few months. So. Absolutely. Yeah. It'll be good to talk to you. Thank you very much for the talk. Thank you. Bye.